it shows that you have a love for trading. It shows that you have a love for teaching. But everything that you post now is all charity and not in a bad way. But what shifted for you? You need to live more. You need to travel more. You need to experience more. And you need to be open-minded. And you'll be shocked at what really moves you and what you can learn from your experiences. Something that's uh, really cool to me, Tim, is that like you're a very successful trader, you're a very successful business owner, entrepreneur, you donate a lot of money to charity. But my question that I love asking people is how do you diversify your income outside of trading? Because I know you donate your trading profits to charity, and I'm sure you have some sort of nest egg to kind of fund your lifestyle. So how do you invest outside of the market to kind of make sure that if you want to never work a day in your life again, you could do that? Is it real estate? Is it? I'm, I'm terrible with that. Um, I have nothing. I, I'm all cash. Um, I'm missing out on this, this bull market because I didn't expect it. Um, my teaching business has lost money for two straight years. People are like, oh, you just teach suckers and you profit off it. I'm like, actually, I've lost money because we're investing in new AI tools and, and new programmers and a bunch of stuff. Um, no, I'm, I'm really not a good businessman. Like people think that I am. They're like, oh, Sykes is such a good marketer. I should have a million students if I was a good marketer. Like, you know, I, I've really broken down these patterns and come up with like this now great archive that I think really could change the lives of millions of people. So no, I'm not a good business person. I'm not a good marketer. I suck at it. But cash is better than most people have. Most people will just blow it all. So the fact that you have cash sitting is very safe as well. Well, I mean, I've made a lot from trading. I've made a lot from teaching in years past. But, um, you know, it, at the same time, I could do so much better. My accountant yells at me like weekly for donating too much compared to my income. He's like, you know, you're not making any money. Like, why are you donating so much? And I'm like, shut up. Um, it's it, you, you have to have priorities. I I. It looks like I spend a lot, but I really don't. Like I'm, I'm actually pretty frugal. Um, I got rid of all my cars. You know, I, I have a place in Miami, just like for my parents, moved them down from Connecticut. I know you want um, to spend money on food though, because there was one time that we went out to dinner together in Miami, and you must have ordered three of everything on the menu. I mean, food. I think is a great value play. If you want to say like, what should you invest in? I think good, great food. Like you can have a world-class dinner and not spend more than like a few hundred or, or a few thousand dollars. It's very tough to get a world-class experience of anything for just a few hundred or a few thousand dollars. If you want like the best of something in an industry, you're going to have to fork over much more. So I think food is a value play and I also love it. And I also love, you know, like not even just eating, but I love eating with friends and like showing people like new cultures, new cuisines. Like I gave Jack Kellogg, like we were in Utah, I, you know, not even like world-class restaurant. I just gave him pad thai for the first time. You know, he, you have to understand Jack Kellogg has been so obsessed with like trading and, and learning. He hasn't gotten out much. Now he's finally getting out a little more. And I'm like giving him pad thai. And he's like, I don't know about this. I was like, trust me, you're going to like it. And then he loved it because pad thai is delicious. And then a few weeks later, we went to Dubai, which is a whole nother level for food. And he loved that. Then we're eating at like the, the top restaurants of this food tour in the UK and Sweden and Norway. He's eating at Geranium, the number one restaurant in the world. Like he's, his education with food like just went up like parallel, like with his, his account, you know, a few thousand dollars to 12 plus million from pad thai to Geranium in like a few months. Yeah, yep. Damn. Damn, that's crazy. Um, yeah, my next question was actually about food. And then Alex said, brought the food up. Um, but I'm wondering if you could give one really good restaurant experience and then one really bad one. Because I'm sure you have a bad one in your mind where you're like, fuck, you, you don't have to say the name so no one gets sued. I'm just wondering. <laughs> I'll tell you, there's a curse of the world's number one restaurants. Uh, Noma, I went to also the number one, uh, what was his name, in, in Italy, and Geranium. Like, all of them have been rather disappointing. When you get to number one, I haven't been to Central in Peru. We were supposed to go to Peru. We have two new computer labs there, but they had political instability, so I had to cancel my trip. The president got arrested, like, literally the week that I was going to go, which sucked. Um, but, like, all the number ones have been rather disappointing um, to me. And, and it's crazy because they're like world's number one. Like whenever I post Noma, everyone's like, oh, do you got in? Like, this is amazing. And I'm like, yeah, I've been to Noma four times. I've been very spoiled. Geranium was good, but I, I wouldn't put it like number one. Like here's a, here's a little TMI tip. 
Jack Kellogg puked everywhere after geranium. He couldn't handle it. He, he missed the next night. We went to Alchemist, which I think is far better. Um, and he missed Alchemist, which is a 50 course, six hour menu. He didn't even make Holy it. Shit. Lucas and I ate it. Lucas is a good eater. Short Bear. Have you had him on yet? You should. Yeah, we're going to get him on soon. I actually went out to dinner with Lucas. It's probably one of the most expensive meals I had. I think it was like 1500 a person. <laughs> I mean, he can he can eat a lot, but he's like seven foot three, you know, so it, it's like a, it's like a small meal for him. But, you know, he's a he's a great guy. Great trader. I'm going to see him in a few weeks in Japan. We've got a, a crazy food tour all over the best restaurants in Japan and like what, three weeks. So I'm excited for that. You know, be very careful with a lot of these rankings. Like I, for me, when I'm, when I'm looking at food, I don't just look at like Michelin. I'm cross-referencing Michelin, TripAdvisor, Yelp, Guyot. I'm looking at everything. Like I, I want to see it. I want to see it all. And, and, you know, Michelin, even the world's top 50 is, is very, you know, biased. It's, it's, you know, you can look at any industry and, and pretty much find corruption. Man, sorry to be negative. Those are short sellers. You love that. I got one more. I got one more question for you, Tim, and then we'll wrap it up. Is if you were to go back and change anything, would you change anything in your career, whether it be starting or anything like that? Any regrets in your trading career, anything like that? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't like. Again, I have like this crazy sense of humor. I wouldn't necessarily i would be more careful with my words i i say a lot of stuff like to make people laugh but like again people take it personally and i'm like i was just kidding like stop having such thin skin you fucking toxic leper short seller you know like so i i <laughs> wish that i wish that short sellers had thicker skin <laughs> no but it's i you know it's i i say dumb stuff sometimes and i wish i could like keep it in but like you know, it's literally verbal diarrhea. Like, you know, if you actually go to India and have like real diarrhea, you can't keep it in. Like it's, you don't have a choice. <laughs> and this is the same kind of thing with this mouth. Like I, I say these things, I'm talking to short sellers. I'm like, you know, preparation for this interview. Don't make short selling jokes. Don't make short selling jokes. I can't, I can't help it. So it's. Yeah, we don't take it personally, bro. It's we, Dude, we're none of us take any people. of this personally at no, all. No, I know, but some some toxic leper short sellers who live in their parents' basements <laughs> and they have five fake usernames in five different chat rooms watching this will take it too personally because it hits too close to home. And they're like, Sim Sykes is talking about me. And, you know, I feel bad. We'll know them we'll in the comments. They'll come out. We'll see them. We'll see them in the comments. I, I joke around. I kid. I kid. I joke with you. Come on. Like, um, what is that? Triumph the little dog. Like, that's what it is. It's it's my my joking that get in my big mouth that gets me in trouble sometimes. If I could just shut the fuck up and like just focus on teaching and trading. But that's that's what makes you that's what makes you so unique, you know? That impression of Adam Sandler was really good. I mean, we're Jewish. It's it's in my genes. It's in my genes. When I'm thin, I can be Adam Sandler, like you know, someone someone actually stopped me the other day. Like this wasn't recent because now I'm like thinnish. But like when I was fat, someone stopped me and they're like, you know, you know, which actor you look like. And like when I was younger, I looked like Ben Affleck. So I was like, yeah, I look like Ben Affleck. Thank you. And they're like, no, you look like Seth Rogen. And I was like, fuck you. You're wrong. You know, I'm like when I'm fat and I'm Jewish, I do look like Seth Rogen. But now Seth Rogen's thin and he's all like, you know, stylish now. So that doesn't even apply. I got I got one more thing that just came into my head because I remember back in the day, Tim, that you had the nice watches, the cars, this, that. Is there any of those big purchases that you regretted immediately after you purchased it? Um, what do you mean? Uh, <laughs> no, but, uh, um, no, it's it wasn't immediate. So I'll I'll tell you one story that really changed my life. Going to the village in Bali really helped. Getting my second Lamborghini was a game changer because first Lamborghini, childhood dream, accomplished. I had used to have posters up on the walls. I never even dreamt as a kid of like owning nice cars. I was like, I just want to drive them. I wanted to drive like a Ferrari Testarossa. Then I owned the Ferrari and the Lambo and the Rolls Royce and the McLaren. And they were fun. They're all fun. But when the second Lamborghini came, I felt nothing. And I was so freaked out. And I had like a whole, you know, short selling-esque, type like health crisis where, you know, I just, I was worried. Like, I was like, why do I feel nothing? Like, this is my childhood dream. But frankly, ever since that moment, like it was, you know, once you're over it, you're over it. And 
I still like nice cars, but I have no desire to own them anymore. Like if I drive them, I drive them. That's cool. But like, it really changed my priorities. And, and I really think that a lot of people should always question their priorities, get very introspective, what motivates you, what moves you, and, and don't be afraid of changing, um, you know, mid, mid uh, journey or, or mid career. Like maybe you don't like your career and, and you should change it. Like, or maybe you don't like your strategy. Maybe, you know, if you're a short seller and I don't want this, I want more short sellers, but if you are a short seller, tired of waking up early, trying to get locates, getting squeezed, having health scares, having, you know, the ERs, like come to you and like, you know, the ambulances cost a lot of money. And I don't know if the short selling brokers have insurance. I don't know how that works, but um, <laughs> you just have to, you have to really judge everything. Like, you know, trading is all about adapting. Um, your goal should also be about adapting. So once I started donating more, really made me happier inside. Um, I know it sounds corny, but it's true. And now trading small, really helps because like trading big, like trading big lost the adrenaline long or short. I don't have the adrenaline rush anymore trading big like I used to when I made my first $100,000 freshman year over the weekend, ISCO bought it in the 17th, sold it in the 29s over the weekend gap up. Um, you know, amazing. Ne sold it too soon. The next day it was at 40. I didn't care. I made over a hundred grand, took my whole freshman dorm out to dinner. One of the best days of my life, opened my mind up to how much you can make. And I didn't even time it perfectly. Then I had a few other 50, $100,000 wins. Every single one of them, less adrenaline rush. I was like, yeah, I still got it, cool. You know, especially short selling. The big thing for me as a teacher, even if I banked on a short, a lot of my students couldn't get the execution. They couldn't get the borrow. I have a whole music video called No Borrow, No Cry. Um, and, and so I-, I I've I seen that. It's pretty fucking I, funny. Like <laughs> I gradually rotated into going long and, and it's, for me now, the the adrenaline rush is when a student makes a thousand or ten thousand a day for the first time, or not even money, but just does a well executed trade. That gives me immense pride. And now I donate all my trading profits to charity. That makes it more meaningful for me because normally, if you make a thousand bucks, it's not going to really influence my life. But a thousand dollars, I know how far that can go in Bali or Philippines or in the thirty countries that we have charity projects. Like forty five dollars can feed a family of five for a month in Bali. You can build a house for $2,500. So now I'm thinking in terms of where can this money go? That makes it more meaningful for me. So always look for meaning in your, your life and in your career. Um, and, and don't be afraid to change. As, I mean, if you had asked me in the beginning, like you would, you would get, you would have all these cars, you would get sick of them. You would donate all your money to charity. You would donate too much compared to your income. And I'd be like, shut the fuck up. What are you talking about? Like goes against everything. This, teenager used to want but now i'm much happier than ever so you just what gotta shifted adapt. what shifted for you what shifted from your love you obviously it shows that you have a love for trading it shows that you have a love for teaching but everything that you post now is all charity and not in a bad way but what shifted for you you know it opened my mind when you travel more i i can't encourage all of you to travel especially to third world countries it gives you perspective and you know part of the reason why we're doing and doing this documentary um for for bali like i i sell finance this is our third documentary i sell finance all of that no donations go to any of that it, all the donations go specifically to the the projects that we do but i self fund this because i want people to see it and you know not just okay, charity is good, helping people in third world countries, that's good. But like seeing how they live, seeing how little they have, but like, especially people in Bali, like they're so positive. They're so just grateful to be alive and to have their family, you know, in the Philippines and Laos and Nepal and South Africa, I was just in Tanzania. All these people have such immense positivity. And then you look at America, the richest, most successful country in the world. We have an opioid crisis. People are so sad about traffic and the political divide. And it's like, do you know how fortunate you are? No, you don't because you don't have perspective. So I really want to show the third world kind of perspective to the first world. I think it can really help just have, have people really be much happier with what they do have. And especially take advantage of the opportunity. Like literally I was in Tanzania with my laptop and like the whole staff came over. They'd never seen a laptop before. We went to this one place. I encourage everyone to go to Pemba Island in Tanzania. It's off the grid. The whole island basically is two, two hotels, really nice hotels, but the rest of the island, they only got electricity last month. 
and we're driving by these little communities and they're literally there's like i saw this one house they had a light bulb and they were all just dancing around the light bulb because they had never been able to see at night like it's it's crazy to me in this day and age and they just got electricity and they were they didn't know like we were driving by they didn't care they were just happy and it was like can you imagine being that happy if you saw a light bulb how many what percent of americans if you just had a black house like a blackout or the power went out and you have a light bulb how many americans what percent would be so happy and you're dancing around the light bulb like yeah 99 percent of americans if you had no power and the light bulb comes back on they would they wouldn't be grateful they'd be angry they'd be like screw this town what's wrong with the government <laughs> like it's just perspective so i i think that you need to live more, you need to travel more, you need to experience more, and you need to be open-minded. And you'll be shocked at what really moves you and what you can learn from your experiences. And understand, most people don't have the luxury of being able to like, oh, I would love to go to a third world country, I would love to go anywhere. Most Americans don't even have savings of a few thousand dollars. They work at a job that they hate. 75% of Americans under the age of 30 hate their jobs. So it's like, it's a luxury to be able to travel. That's part of the reason why, you know, one of the, one of you guys asked, do you ever get tired of creating content? It's a luxury for me to travel and it's a luxury for me to share it because I want more people to see this stuff. Is there a Tim Sykes charitable jet line coming soon to an airport near you? No, I don't even do jets anymore. I mean, that was during the pandemic. Um, one one crazy time, I was on this this program called Jet Suite. I don't know if you remember Jet Suite or Jet Smarter. Um, Jet Smarter. Jet Suite still goes to Vegas. Jet Smarter. It was like Uber for jets, and I think I paid like five grand or seven grand for the year, and you could just take jets like anywhere. And it was crazy. Like there was like random people on the jet, and I was like, "Oh, what are you guys doing going there?" And they're like, "Wow, oh, we got nothing else to do." And it's like free unlimited jet thing. But during this was like my last jet ride and we lost, uh, what was it? What, what's steering on a jet called? There's a word for it. Why do I always forget this? Do you guys know? No. A turbine? I got no clue. No. I should know this. Anyways, there was a loud crash and I, I heard a crash and we couldn't land at the airport that we needed to. And like my parents were coming to pick me up. Like it was, it was scary. There was nothing I could do. Loud crash. Like people are crying. And it was it was during like the, the Bitcoin spike and everyone was like a crypto holder on the plane. And I was just picturing like the headlines like you have like seven crypto traders and one penny stock trader dead. Like this is the top. And I was just like, I'm going to fucking go down in a jet with these crypto fucks. Yeah. And I was so pissed. That's the worst. Way, that's the worst way to go with all the crypto guys in the plane with you. <laughs> it was there was an emergency landing. Like it was a rough landing. Um, we're all okay. And you're going down like, with crypto hodlers. <laughs> and it was it was right when like Bitcoin was at like you know fifty five thousand. It already crested a little bit, and it was like after Sailor was like, put your whole house, mortgage your house, mortgage your business, put into Bitcoin. Shut the fuck up, Sailor. You grow, you you throw fantastic parties. You out of touch billionaire. People shouldn't mortgage their home and their business to go into crypto. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> And this was this was my my last jet ride. I haven't gone on a jet ride since. Um, they they usually don't even have good Wi Fi. Like I I need good Wi Fi. Like you know so no 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 jet line. And also again like the the charity is completely separate. We donate a hundred percent to all the projects. We're a five hundred one c three. People think that like oh you have a a charity. No, I'm transparent with my trades. I'm tra transparent with my donations. So I want to be clear about that. 